and let's see, 13, wow, 13, a lot of participants now. All right. Good evening, everybody. Welcome to Eco Athletes Presents Professional Athletes and Game Changers Discuss Plant Based Diets, Athletic Performance, and Climate Change. Thank you so much for joining us tonight. I'm Lou Blaustein, the founder of Eco Athletes, and we are really excited to bring you this panel about a topic that has gotten a lot of play over the last several years. Broadly speaking, that's the move towards plant-based diets. And more narrowly, and for our purposes, uh, plant-based diets and the increasing adoption of them by athletes. And tonight, we will be joined by three plant-based athletes who will discuss their lifestyle and how it affects athletic performance in a positive way, and also climate change um, in a positive way. So uh, before we get into that, just a little bit about eco-athletes. And eco-athletes, uh, I founded it, launched it back in April of this year. And our mission is to inspire and coach athletes to take climate action. Put another way, uh, what we want to do is deploy athletes, um, to, to, to deploy the Muhammad Ali's, the Megan Rapinos, the Colin Kaepernick's of climate change. Because right now, we are in the fourth quarter of the climate battle, and we are behind, and we need a climate comeback. And who better than athletes to lead such a comeback? Because athletes make positive change, make social change happen from civil rights to women's rights and many other issues, but not yet on climate. So that's where Eco Athletes steps in. We um, deliver uh, virtual workshops, um, uh, climate, uh, climate communications workshops for athletes. And we also coach athletes on an individual basis to be able to take climate action. We are blessed to have a team that is second to none. And you will be hearing from uh, our strategic advisor, Kristen Fulmer, who in the slide that you're looking at is in the middle. And then also um, Brittany Carmen, our digital content strategist who does a lot more than that. And we also um, are, are, are have an, um, an advisory board that is also top shelf. And we're talking about um, climate scientists who are uh, world-renowned climate scientists, world-renowned um, uh, business folk, and also sports media folk, and athletes. Two of our eco-athlete champions, Brent Suter and Alexander Rickham, Brent Suter of the Milwaukee Brewers and Alexander Rickham, uh, Olympic, an Olympic medal-winning um, Paralympic sailor, are also among our eco-athlete champions network. And we now have 28 eco-athlete champions. They are from all over the world, men, women, from a myriad of sports. And what they do is our champions spread the word about eco-athletes to their platform. And really, that is the power of, of athletes using their platform. And so they share our social media and they share our climate comeback hashtag. And so the... Our, our champions are core to what we do. One more thing before we get started. Um, tonight's event is part of our um, fall fundraiser. So anyone who uh, uh, can, can give, we would much appreciate that. But now we are going to get to the reason you all are here, which is our discussion. And our, um, our moderator, 
is uh, Jim Giles, and he is a startup founder, a journalist, an analyst, and a consultant who works on climate policy and technology. He works at GreenBiz, which many of you have read, I'm sure, uh, and also is an events organizer there. And he chairs two of the company's conferences, Verge Food and Verge Carbon. So now you see why Jim is uh, moderating tonight's panel. And he also writes Food Weekly, an email newsletter about sustainable food systems. So with, uh, without any more delay, over to Jim Giles to start our panel. Great, thanks so much, Lou and Kristen and Brittany, uh, and to the panel whom I'll introduce in a minute. I am super excited to be bringing this fantastic group together and to talking about this, uh, such an important topic. And I, before we dive in, I just wanna kind of spend a minute thinking about how we got to where we are, because I think that's really important. So a, a lot of the things that we're talking about now in climate and, and climate change and the ways that we have to tackle climate change actually date from around 1992, when there was a big meeting called the Earth Summit held in Rio. And it's, I think, kind of depressing in a way to be thinking, well, we've been thinking about this for 30 years and we've missed all these opportunities to, to make progress. Um, and I think there's a lot of truth in that, but that can also obscure the incredible progress that is actually happening right now. So we have a new administration that's come in and it's pledged an emissions-free power sector by 2035. And, and that's an incredible, whether it's possible for them to achieve it politically, it's incredible to think from a technological point of view that that's something that we can even be talking about. And that's happening because we're in the process of decarbonizing our electricity sector. We're taking oil and gas, sorry, coal and gas out of electricity generation. It's incredible. We're also making amazing progress um, on transport. Um, California, where I live, has uh, Governor Newsom has pledged to ban the sale of gas powered cars by 2035. Another thing that, you know, 10 years ago would have just seemed ridiculously ambitious. Um, these things are now possible because of the progress we've made. And the reason I mention electricity and transport is because it's really interesting to think about the progress we're making there and to contrast it with food. So I hope you can all see the slide uh, that Brittany had put, put up there. Thanks, Brittany, for doing that. Uh, just have a look. So in, in the top right there, this is what we're looking here is where greenhouse gases come from globally uh, by economic sector. So in the top right there, you can see electricity and heat production, that's 25%. And then you can see transportation, that I also mentioned 14%. But then look at the yellow quadrant in the, the bottom right there. That's agriculture and associated things uh, that go into food production. It's as big as electricity. It's quite a lot bigger than transportation. So think of all the attention that we're paying to electricity and transportation, all the progress, all the policy initiatives, all the private sector investment, and, and then ask yourselves, are the same things happening on food? And, and the answer is absolutely no. And this is uh, a big problem and a curious problem in a way, given the fact that, as you can see, food is just as important as these other things that I've been talking about. Now, we don't right now have these super ambitious sector-wide goals that we're seeing in electricity and transportation in food, and we need those things. But what we do have uh, are things that we, we as individuals can do immediately. And we're here today to talk about one of them. And uh, Brittany, thanks for moving that slide on. So what we're looking at now in this new slide, we're looking at the pounds of CO2 equivalent. So you can just think of that as greenhouse gases, the pounds of greenhouse gases emitted for each serving of uh, common foods that we eat regularly. Just have a look at this graph and look at the legend there on the top right. And you'll see, I'm just counting the top six highest emitting foods all come from animals. So if we, we may be lacking the big government and corporate work in this area that we need to transform emissions, but as individuals, the message is very clear to us. What we need to do is take some of these animal products, really as many as possible, and swap them out for plant-based products. Um, and that, thankfully, is something that we are all able to do. And we're going to hear from uh, three amazing people uh, right now who are pioneering uh, this approach to diet. So uh, I will just introduce uh, Phoebe James and Gary right now, and then we will dive into the discussion. 
So Phoebe Champion uh, captained the water polo team at Princeton University while earning All-American honors. And she played with the US national team and continued her career post-college as a professional water polo player in Italy. Uh, her master's team won the Masters World Championship in South Korea in 2019. She's a 26-year vegetarian and a 13-year vegan now working in the wine industry. So welcome, Phoebe. Uh, we also have with us James Wilkes, who's the producer and narrator of The Game Changers, which is a critically acclaimed documentary about the dramatic rise of plant-based eating in professional sports. Uh, James is best known for winning season nine of The Ultimate Fighter, uh, but he also serves as a trainer for government agencies, including the US Marshals, US Marines, and US Navy SEALs. Men's Health UK recently ranked James as number three on their list of the 13 most, most influential men in health and fitness. And finally, we have Gary Gilliam, who's a free agent NFL offensive linesman who plays seven seasons with the Seattle Seahawks and the San Francisco 49ers. He's the founder of the Bridge Eco Village, which is an innovative mixed use real estate development, uh, which has been piloted in his native Harrisburg in Pennsylvania, that amongst other things will convert, convert abandoned warehouses into schools uh, sorry, abandoned warehouses and schools into urban agriculture hubs. So welcome Phoebe, James and Gary, how are you all doing? Great, thanks so much for having us on. Doing well, thanks guys. Great, well I really appreciate you being here. So maybe we could start just by hearing just, you know, briefly your personal stories uh, that led you all to switch to a plant-based diet. And James, do you want to kick off? Yeah, I mean, the, my, my story is, obviously, is covered in the, the Game Changers, but for those who haven't seen it or it's been a while since they have, I was training for a fight against the future heavyweight champion and I fought at welterweight, so he had about 80 or 90 pounds on me. Uh, probably wasn't the best decision to spar with someone that much bigger two weeks before a fight. Essentially, I tore ligaments in both of my knees and I knew I'd have six months where I really couldn't um, train properly and I'd have to just do rehab. So I thought, what can I do with my time to be productive? and you know realized that i should really look into nutrition um so i started looking at that looking at the peer-reviewed literature trying to discover the best uh, nutrition for optimal recovery and then after i was recovered for athletic performance that's when i came across a study about the roman gladiators so scientists analyzed over 5,000 bones and uh could basically tell that these gladiators were eating an almost exclusively plant-based diet and i thought well that can't be true because you've got to have you know, meat and other animal products to be strong and healthy, meat, especially for the muscles, we think, and, you know, dairy for the bones. And then I thought sort of vegetables and things like that were for sort of the micronutrients and a bit of fiber. I uh, didn't really think you could get much protein from plant foods and really felt that we needed animal food. So that was enough to get me to start really looking into the literature. Um, while making the film, I, I spent um, over a thousand hours of uh, peer-reviewed, uh, looking at peer-reviewed nutrition in that first uh, year. And then during the rest of the film, spent probably another 2,000 hours looking at peer-reviewed science and just realized everything I'd been taught um, about the necessity of animal protein was basically a lie. And, uh, and during the early days, I just decided to document that and um, felt like a documentary was the best way to get that to the world. So that's, uh, that's my story. Great. Thanks so much, James. And, and Phoebe, what about you? What led you to become, I think, it 26 years as a vegetarian. Yeah, so let's rewind to the mid 90s. And one of, I'm the youngest of four girls and one of my older sisters, Laurel, was doing a report on cruelty to animals for school. And we all loved animals, were shocked by the vast um, normalized you know, cruelty towards animals, whether it's in testing or in food processing and immediately became vegetarians. Fortunately, you know, our parents were uh, willing enough to support this and adapt the way that they fed us at that time. And, you know, credit to my mother for doing a lot of early research on her own and finding ways to get the necessary calories, nutrition balance to for athletes who were training two to five hours a day um, as kids, as teens. And this really just grew as time went on. And back then it wasn't so easy to find alternatives or find 
the available or the availability of vegetarian and vegan food that we now see. Um, so it, it took a little bit of persistence, but we we never felt um, at a, you know at a disadvantage athletically, and certainly not in competition. I think you know we all felt like we had very successful careers in our you know, whether it's swimming or water polo, and. I certainly never had any issue getting to a certain size, eating vegetarian or vegan. I have never been a small person, so uh, there was no concern there. Um, and it just, you know, it, it tasted good and it felt good. And then we learned more about the environmental and health aspects too, as, as the publication of what I'll call modern science became more widespread. Um, and it really just solidified the reason why we were doing what we were doing. That's great to hear. And I think we should dig into some of that science a bit later, but let's hear from Gary, just to round off this intro question. Gary, what was your journey to plant-based diets? Yeah, so um, I mean, I was an offensive lineman, but always a, a fairly lean offensive lineman. Um, but I took it upon myself to always get my blood panel done to see kind of where my levels were at. And year after year after year, my cholesterol was high. Um, and I, so I ended up being on, on Crestor and, you know, so taking some medication to get that under control, uh, even adjusted my diet to the way that I thought it had, you know, should be from, from my doctors told me and still my, you know, my cholesterol was high. So I was like, doc, like, what's up? Like, why is my cholesterol high? And her only answer was, you know, you're black. And I was like, well, that didn't really make sense. Um, so I, you know, I did a bit more research and the correlation to the blackness was more of a cultural correlation and what black people eat. Uh, and what and what they have eaten over generations. Um, so once I figured that out, I was like, okay, well, I have high cholesterol due to, to, to what I'm eating. Well, what is what exactly is cholesterol? So, you know, found out that there's good cholesterol, bad cholesterol, um, and then dug deeper into that about where cholesterol comes from and how it affects your body. Um, so as I dug deeper into that and I, and I noticed that the more cholesterol you have in your blood, the less efficient your whole body is. It leads to diabetes, heart disease, cancer, uh, you know, three leading causes, not just of black individuals, but of Americans in general. And you can only find that cholesterol in animal products. But that was all the proof that I needed to know, you know, if I wanna be the most efficient body um, and entity that I can be, I gotta put the right fuel in it, not something that's gonna clog up my pipes. And uh, so that's what started me down my journey. Yeah, that's so interesting. And maybe we could just move on to the next question with you, Gary. So you made that transition. Uh, what what impact did you notice on your athletic abilities as you transitioned into a, a plant based diet? Yeah, so I recovered a lot faster, um, which is obviously huge for an athlete and working out and your performance and everything. Um, you know, just less sluggish. Um, I had a pretty bad knee injury in college. And um, once I went plant-based, you know, all that inflammation was gone. I ended up actually getting an MRI done and then and my meniscus was actually starting to repair itself, which isn't supposed to happen. So just some pretty interesting things started happening. Um, and I noticed that, you know, within a few days and then obviously weeks and months, you know, just constantly doing it, you really realize it, like I said, in your workouts and your recovery. Yeah. And James, what about you? Did you notice similar things? Um, yeah, I mean, it's always hard for me for, you know, recovery from exercise, certainly I, I felt a difference recovery from injuries, you know, it's hard to say, you know, each injury is individual. So it's tough for me to say whether I healed more quickly because of that. I mean, um, my endurance and strength definitely improved, you know, as people that have seen the film, uh, sort of the battling ropes where it's a 50 foot rope that's tied around the pole and you're keeping that rope going. The most I'd ever got was eight minutes before. And of course, this is not like a full-on sprint. You can't last too long doing that. It's more like a jog with the ropes, basically keeping the waves going. Um, and at the gym I trained at, if you got um, 10 minutes, you put your name on the wall. And I, even training for UFC fights, I'd never um, you know, managed to get the, eight, the 10 minutes. And then I went plant-based. Uh, once I was 100% plant-based, after six weeks of uh, eating entirely plant-based, I'd sort of ramped up into it. You know, more gradually, which is what we sort of suggest for most people anyway. Um, but I thought I'd try going 100% uh, plant-based. And within six weeks, I actually went a straight hour, uh, which just blew my mind. Um, and I, I felt like I could have kept going. My hands were bleeding a little bit from the blisters, but uh, endurance-wise. And then my strength went up, which I didn't mention in the documentary, but you know, I'm not, uh, you know, I fought at 170. So for some people, this doesn't sound like very much weight. And for some people it does, but you know, I, I over you know, last couple of years before I went plant-based, 
I got up to uh, 105 pound dumbbells in each hand for, you know, five reps. And within like a matter of a month, I went to 115s for six reps. So um, sets of six reps. So again, some people laugh and say that's not much weight. And then for regular people, they probably think that's quite a bit of weight. But regardless, for my personal um, strength, uh, you know, that went that went up as well. So um, yeah, and now like, you know, I'm 42 now and I'm feeling, I've got more muscle than I've ever had, um, stronger than I've ever been, even though I'm not competing anymore. And, uh, you know, endurance feels good as well. So definitely seemed to have an impact for me. Yeah, it's great. It's so impressive to hear. Uh, that sounds like a lot of weight to me, James, just to, you know, to put it into perspective. Probably, um, probably not for Gary. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. But, uh, you know, I've always had a kind of a small chest and then I'm not, you know, the bigger, I'm like six foot and a four to 170. I'd walk around like 187 or something like that. And we cut, cut weight for the fight. So it's, it's not a huge weight, but for me, uh, chest was one of my weak areas and um, managed to, uh, you know, bump it up a little bit, which was pretty significant as a percentage of the increase, you know. You know, that is significant because that weight is like small or well, receivers, small receivers on a football team. So for them to throw up a hundred pound dumbbell, yeah, that's significant. <laughs> yeah. And Phoebe, I think your situation was maybe a bit different because like, if I understood your story correctly, you know, you were already a vegetarian at the beginning of your career, but I guess you were able to compare yourself to your, uh, the folks you, you worked with and competed against uh, who presumably were not largely vegetarians. Did you notice any differences there? You know, I just, I always felt like my training was at a really good speed and my recovery time was quite good. Um, I never, I think I would describe it for myself as I never felt deficient. And if anything, when I went vegan, you know, full vegan from prior or previously being vegetarian, while I was in college, I amped up the training afterwards. I joined the swim team in the off season in order to increase training. And, um, you know, when we weren't playing water polo and we weren't in season and there was certainly concern from all the coaches and some of my teammates around whether or not I would get the calories and nutrition that I needed. And, um, it was kind of funny to, I felt like it was kind of funny to hear because I was definitely one of the biggest on the team. I was, um, you know, again, I felt pretty effective um, relatively consistently in the pool. And I did know, you know, I wish I had a frame of reference from, you know, not from being an athlete and not being vegetarian to being a vegetarian ath athlete. But I always felt it was interesting when, uh, in college, one of my, my college boyfriend was an offensive lineman. And as soon as their season ended, he and a few of his teammates decided to go vegetarian for 90 days as a way to try to, you know, reset their bodies. As they said, you know, we're, we're done with football. We want to get back to eating healthy and try to do something different for our bodies that feels right. And not only did they all lose a tremendous amount of weight, they said that they just felt, they felt lighter and they felt strong and they felt more energetic. And at the time that was fascinating for me to hear because like I said, I had no frame of reference for my own experience of such an extreme dietary change. And, you know, it was admittedly, it was really good to hear. I was like, okay, you know, I, I feel like I am doing the right thing then for my body. Yeah, that's fascinating. And, and James and Gary, I'm, I'm curious as to, to what you heard from the folks you work with, because I think you're both in sports where, um, you know, there is a prejudice around the need to eat meat in order to maintain like a certain level of strength. And there's a very like fundamental thing in our culture around sort of this link or this, uh, you know, supposed link between meat and raw strength. Um, and so I'm imagining that when you decided, no, I'm going to go vegetarian, there were a few raised eyebrows. What was that experience like? Well, for me, um, you know, being an offensive lineman and, you know, being over 300 pounds, that was the main thing. Coach was like, you know, are you going to be able to, to maintain your weight, uh, you know, obviously along with your strength? And um, I said, like, hey, you know, don't believe me, just watch, you know, so it was more just, hey, look, like, this is what, you know, I can do. 
This is what we're supposed to do. This is how I'm recovering. You know, as James said, you know, I'm getting stronger. My endurance is better. You see it on the field. You see it in practice. You know, you see it um, in the game. So it was, the, you know, they didn't have an issue with it, obviously. It was just, all right, well, your weight's up. You're doing what you need to on the field. Um, it was more, you know, from other players. And they would even check, you know, like, hey, you know, what are you eating for lunch? What are you eating for breakfast? Like, you say you're vegan. Like, you know, what, what is that about? And they'd see my stuff. And I'm like, okay, well, that's not too different from what I eat. You know, it's like, well, yeah. And then they, you know, again, see how you're how you're operating on the field and seeing your recovery, really, um, especially because they understand the load that we have. And then, you know, I shoot, bounce right back, you know, the next day and everyone else is kind of, you know, dragging a bit. Uh, so, you know, from players and coaches, it's like, it's, like you said, it's not something that's really done in the NFL, um, especially not for an offensive lineman. Um, so, I, you know, I enjoyed, you know, proving everybody, proving to them that having a plant-based diet and maintaining that strength and that weight is totally possible. So I'm curious, Gary, what that diet looks like to, that, that you need to maintain the strength and weight. Give, give us an idea of like breakfast, lunch, and dinner. What does that look like for you? I it's just, it's more food, you know, your portions are bigger, you know, so I, I, I enjoy fruit and oatmeal for breakfast, you know, for lunch, you know, you got your pastas, um, different breads. If you want to throw in some of those plant-based meats, uh, if you're, if you're about that, you can do that there. Um, and then, you know, for dinner, you've got rice and beans, lots of rice and beans, you know, you make some plant-based tacos. There's a plant-based pizza. If you want to go that route, you know, there's tons of different things you can eat. Um, and, and for me, I was heavy, <laughs> uh, you know, late time or late night snacking with, with you know, plant-based ice creams and, and Oreos and stuff like that. So if you don't want to be 300 pounds, I'd say avoid those things. But um, I definitely added those to mine. You know, being an offensive lineman, it was okay to have a little bit, you know, extra weight. It was all right. So, uh, you know, that's what I did. Right. I think a lot of people, Gary, are going to be envious of that, the need for the late night ice cream and the justification you had for it. Uh, but James, what about you? You know, you're in a similar sport where, again, there's this, I would imagine, like a just uh, a sort of default assumption that meat is essential to success. What, uh, how, how did the folks you work with react? Yeah, I mean, I think people were skeptical at first, but then when they saw that I wasn't uh, deteriorating and, and still doing really well, um, in fact, here in Orange County, California, where I live, um, just people in the MMA community started really jumping on board. Um, and in the UFC, you know, there's a lot of people that they might not be fully vegan, but, you know, guys like Nate and uh, Nick Diaz, and there's a bunch of fighters now that are shifting to plant-based diets. So I think, um, you know, to start with, uh, people were a bit close-minded, but I think that's really changing now. And then obviously once the documentary came out, I think that's, um, you know, really changed people's minds as well. And I think another thing obviously is not just about the strength and the, and the protein, but the sort of masculinity aspect where people feel like, you know, real men eat meat. Um, and obviously this is clearly not true. And in fact, you know, the, the meat and dairy products and the, and the eggs, you could actually make us less manly in a way, less virile and, and so forth. So um, I think people have really woken up and, and realizing, you know, they've been lied to by the meat industry and uh, you can cut out the middlemen, right? And, and go straight to the source. You know, all animals are doing is consuming all the great stuff and then absorbing, you know, the phytonutrients and a lot of the minerals. And then, you know, you're still getting some minerals and vitamins, but you're also getting all the negative stuff, the cholesterol and the saturated fat. And then these um, compounds that we're finding more about in the last 10 years, uh, TMAO, which is, looks like it's inflammatory. Uh, these heterocyclic amines, when you cook meat, uh, is a carcinogen. Um, so I think people are realizing that we can cut that middleman out and go straight to the source, right? And uh, not only is it better for us, obviously it's, it's better for the environment as well. Yeah, I think that's a great point, James. You know, the, the system that we have, we're talking about protein here, the system that we have for consuming protein is insane. It's where the middlemen, as you put it, the animals uh, consume lots of protein that we have to grow somewhere else. And we then have to raise those animals and then we eat the protein. And that involves a lot more energy and a lot more land and a lot more greenhouse gas emissions. And that's, you know, going back to that chart I showed at the beginning, that's why we have the fact that the, the animal products are the high emissions food uh, and cutting out that middleman would have a, a huge impact for global emissions. Yeah, it's just um, super inefficient, right? Whether you're investing or whether you're thinking about your training, you wouldn't do something that, that, was, that was that inefficient, right? To get the same results. So it's just better just to cut out the middleman and, you know, on average six times the amount of protein in to get, you know, the same unit of protein out uh, through animals. So there's no need to do that. Go straight to the source. 
Right, so in, a, in about 10, uh, 10 minutes from now, uh, we'll take some questions from the audience. So do drop your questions into the chat um, and I'll put a couple more to the panel in the meantime. Uh, so one thing I'm curious about is trends within the sporting communities that you work in. Uh, is it still the case? And some of you have alluded to the, the fact that this probably isn't true anymore, but to what extent are, are you all seen as kind of pioneers or even eccentrics or uh, is, is there a trend that, uh, that, that more and more people are, are joining you in, in plant-based diets? Uh, Phoebe, why don't you tell us what's happening in your world? I think eccentrics is a really nice way to put it. For a long time, I received more than just eyebrows and um, it's, I think, a little bit easier to get into discussion around when your decision is morally based, which it was for me originally. Um, which has since expanded to include all the other motives that, you know, we've already talked about here. But at the time, especially, you know, late 90s, early 2000s, the vegetarian community was largely, at least in up in Northern California, seemed largely relegated to Berkeley, Oakland. It was seen as more uh, attached to almost like political social movements than it was health oriented or accessible to a broader athletic community. And um, I think as we've started to change the labels around what being vegetarian or vegan or plant-based means, it's made a lot more space for folks to get involved without feeling like hypocrites because I know you know, as soon as you say vegetarian or vegan and people go, oh man, well that means, you know, committing a hundred percent to never eating meat or never eating dairy. And that is daunting, of course, you know, that's a huge change for most people to make overnight. And, and then you talk about, oh, well, I can't wear leather. Like there's all these other elements of what people think being vegetarian and vegan means. And it doesn't, just because you don't feel like doing it 100% of the time, you know, way or 100% of the time, I always tried to tell people, just do whatever is comfortable for you or right for you and try different things. And I think you know, this new plant-based label that has become a lot more widely used and accepted is a great thing. And I think that has actually allowed folks to feel safe experimenting without uh, without, yeah, worrying about being labeled a hypocrite. And since um, since the expansion of a lot of this modern science that we're talking about too, that's given folks the fact-based reasoning and motives that they needed before that justify the decision other than, you know, oh, you like animals, so you're soft, or um, that's weird because it's different. And it's it's really great to see, I think the other way that I slowly got friends and teammates around to the idea was, you know, through their stomachs, right? That's the best way to people's hearts. And anytime I had something really good, whether we baked it or cooked it and you share it with folks and they go, whoa, that's vegan? Like, that's amazing. And I was like, yeah, it can be done. It can be delicious too, <laughs> you know? Um, and that was always really fun to see and open people's horizons too, because Unfortunately, as we all get older, I think somewhat ironically, although we have more information, we oftentimes becomes, become more close-minded and uh, less open to change and trying new things. So um, it takes a little bit of persistence too. I think that's a great point, Phoebe, uh, to, to draw the, the difference between vegetarian, vegan and plant-based you know, if we're advocating for a plant-based diet, it's not the case of insisting that everyone give up meat immediately. If people just take, start with a single meal and switch it to a plant-based meal, switch your Whopper for an impossible Whopper, uh, you're immediately having an impact right there and then on global emissions. It's a significant one. Um, and, and, and like you say, Phoebe, as people start to do that experiment, they will discover, wow, this stuff tastes great. You don't need to eat meat uh, to really, really enjoy food. Uh, so I really appreciate you raising that. Uh, James and then, and then Gary, what, tell us about the trends that you're seeing in your sporting communities. Are more people adopting this kind of diet? Yeah, I mean, like I was saying before, a lot of people in MMA are really shifting. I mean, one thing I'd like to mention is, you know, in, in doing research for the film, it took seven years to make. And so we talked to a lot of different athletes um, 
you know, not just the ones that were in the film. And, and what was interesting is I found that um, people that were in individual sports were more likely to shift to a plant-based diet and also be open about it. And I found that people in team-based sports, um, you know, they sort of were open to a lot more peer pressure. And because of sort of the previous negative stigma before the Game Changers came out about sort of vegan, vegetarian, plant-based eating, um, the people were less likely to switch over. You know, they try it for a little bit, they get some you know, crap from their teammates and they go back. Or some guys even wouldn't um, be open about it because they didn't want to, um, there's a couple of reasons. One, some people didn't want to, there were some boxers we talked to that didn't want to give away their advantage because uh, they felt the, the diet was a big advantage. And then the other thing is that they didn't want to tell their teammates because they didn't want to catch a bunch of uh, flack from their teammates. In fact, some of them would actually hide their, uh, like for example, there's like Amy's frozen burritos or some of these protein powders were a bit more sort of feminine colored or uh, sort of more traditionally feminine colored. And, and they would sort of hide them in the lockers or the with the burritos at the bottom of the freezer because they really uh, were good. I mean, eight out of 10 vegetarians and vegans in the past before the game changers um, were uh, female. And so a lot of the products are geared towards that. And some of these guys literally uh, would, would try and hide that. Um, and so things are changing, right? You know, the perception of it is changing. And in the same way that uh, in team sports, if, they, if you're the only one, it's gonna be tough. And so it's gonna hard to get that snowball rolling. But once you have a few of them, you know, like with the Tennessee Titans going, you know, a bunch of those guys going plant-based, then it sort of starts the snowball. And I think this is such a, as Malcolm Gladwell would say, you know, a sticky idea. Like it makes total sense. And once you get to that 10, 15% tipping point, uh, you know, it's better for your health. It's better for performance. It's uh, better for world hunger. It's better for the environment. It's better for the animals. Um, I think that's so, such a sticky idea that it's going to snowball. And as we're seeing, it's, uh, you know, plant-based eating is, is growing rapidly. Great. And then before we move to the audience questions, Gary, just tell us about the trends you're seeing. Yeah, uh, James nailed it. You know, I had, I had began my journey of being plant-based before Game Changers had come out. Um, and, you know, I was open about it. I, I'm a weird football player anyway. Like, I'm super involved in, like, nerdy things. I'm a nerd trapped in the athlete's body. So I was okay to go against the grain. But there were plenty of players who are not like that. Um, but you know what, after game changers came out and more people saw it, they definitely came to me like, Oh dude, like now I see why, you know, you doing what you're doing, like, you know, asking questions, really want to do it, whether they were athletes or not athletes, you know, that documentary did a, a fantastic job of really taking the information and correlating it to your, um, your athletic ability, uh, and what you could do, like, uh, James said in strength, endurance and recovery. So, I uh, I think people just need to see more of the information, kind of get the visuals and, and really then they, they'll, you know, try it. And um, I think you're right, Jim, that it is, like, at least how I transitioned with, you know, choosing one meal to switch that to being plant-based and then, you know, moving on from there was the way that I did it myself. And, um, you know, it, it, that does, you know, prevent, you know, like Phoebe said, people from really like almost marrying the vegan thing. Like, oh my gosh, like I'm married to this person now forever. I can't do anything else. Like, no, like it's all right. <laughs> it's not the same situation. Like we want your diet to become your lifestyle, but in that transition, like it's totally okay, you know, to, to go back, just realize and, and observe yourself. You know, if you decide you want to eat a bacon cheeseburger, monitor how that makes you feel and think and, and all those other things. Um, yeah. Great. Thanks everyone. It's so encouraging to hear all this stuff. Um, so Lou and Kristen and Brittany, I, I think you've been keeping an eye on the chat. Uh, what are we hearing from the audience in terms of questions for the panel? Yeah, sure. We've we've actually gotten some great questions, and I think we can kind of match them up so uh, each person can respond to a question. Um, we can kind of get through them all. Uh, so Phoebe, I might start with you. Uh, Rebecca asked um, just how much of an impact you see between vegetarian and veganism. That transition, um, taking out dairy and taking out some of those items. What are what are some of those effects that that you typically see, or that you saw, or that other people that you've you've talked to have seen? Yeah, you know, I think for myself at the time, the, you know, when I was transitioning from just vegetarian to vegan, I was reluctant mostly because I still needed the sugar satisfaction. I still needed that, um, yeah, that other element of satisfaction in my diet that came from desserts and sweet things. And then it became less of an issue when alternatives like soy-based ice creams and almond 
milk based ice creams um, became much more widely available. It wasn't really an issue. And so I don't know that I, um, because my the actual content of what I was eating didn't change so much. Although I do feel like um, every time after I would eat normal ice cream, like cow milk ice cream, my, um, you know, phlegm production, sorry for being very open about that, but um, yeah, my phlegm production was higher and my body just did seem to not really like it. Um, and when I cut that out, that decreased. And I know a lot of friends comment on when they stop eating cheese, cow cheese, um, that their bodies change drastically in their reaction to food. Uh, you know, they don't, they don't struggle to digest food. They don't have similar reactions like the one that I was just describing. Um, you know, there, there's plenty of data out there that shows that humans are not really built to consume dairy products from other animals. We're, you know, we're the only species that does consume the dairy products of another species. And um, when you look at the, you know, talking about consuming protein and um, the source of protein, when you think about what cow's milk is designed to do, it's designed to take a tiny baby calf and grow it into a full-size heifer. And the cow, while consuming cow milk, does the bulk of its growth while on cow milk. So if you just apply that idea on its own to yourself and the way that's probably affecting your own body, um, it, it seems like a pretty like a pretty clear motive, another, you know, another reason to think again about putting something like that in your body. And um, I think cheese does seem to be a really hard one for friends of mine that everyone always says like, I could never give up cheese. That would be my thing, you know? Um, but I, at the same time, I do know a lot of those friends love some of these vegan cheeses that are coming out now. And my brother-in-law calls them nut products and he doesn't, he won't even call it cheese, but some of them are really good. And, you know, it's so much of it is just mental, right? I've had people try them and not tell them that it was fake cheese. And then they go, oh, this is really good, but it tastes a little bit different. What is it? And then I'll tell them and they're like, oh, okay. You know, it's, it's not so bad. So it's, getting around your own mindset is, seems to be a big part of it. Um, but it, you know, I've never heard negative feedback. Let's put it that way. There's always positive feedback from a, from a bodily standpoint. Awesome. Yeah. Thanks for sharing that. Uh, Maria actually asked a question in the Q and A. So if you wouldn't mind Phoebe, just typing in, in the chat, um, just a few recommendations you have if, and others, um, for yeah. your favorite, uh, non-dairy cheeses. Um, I might answer Maria's question as well. Um, looks like the next question came in from Ines, who uh, was asking about working with the help of a nutritionist. Um, and, and James, I think this is a perfect question for you. Um, you know, what is it like working with a nutritionist that does recommend meat? Um, and, and how do you kind of find the right nutritionist? Um, and, and what is your reaction in general um, when nutritionists are recommending meat? Yeah, I mean, I do think it's wise to get a healthcare professional when you're changing your diet, you know, to weigh in uh, for most people. Um, having said that, you know, the Academy of Nutrition and Dietetics, which is the uh, organization that certifies registered dietitians, um, is sponsored by industry. Just, you know, all you got to do is go on their page and uh, see all of the people that give them money. You know, I've talked to dietitians and they've told me, you know, the handouts that they get in college that say you should be eating three servings of dairy a day. I mean, that is at the bottom, it says this is funded by the National Dairy Council. <laughs> so they're literally paying and then influencing the information that's going to this education. So if, if you get people that just sort of go through their college education and their registered dietitian um, training and exams, and they're not critical thinkers, they're going to just sort of have their blinkers on and believe sort of the traditional narrative. Um, if you get people that have gone through that education, but they're sort of uh, critical thinkers, independent thinkers, um, that's what you're looking for, right? As someone that's more open. Um, I mean, even now, there's there's so much evidence that the Academy of Nutrition and Dietetics, in their position statement on vegetarian, vegan, and plant-based diets, said that all of those are um, absolutely fine for all stages of the life cycle, including pregnancy, uh, infancy, uh, childhood, adolescence, 
um, adulthood and into old age, including for athletes. Um, and so, you know, with the, with the science that's come out, it's very hard for them to deny. So if a registered dietitian isn't saying that you, you really can't be plant-based or vegan or vegetarian, whatever you like to say, um, then they're not even following the guidelines anymore of the uh, Academy of Nutrition and Dietetics itself. And all of the world's leading health organizations are now recognizing that plant-based diets own, not, aren't only um, fine, but that they actually confer health benefits in reducing uh, chronic diseases. 80% of the chronic diseases that we suffer from, from heart disease and cancer and diabetes and so forth, can be halted and in some cases reversed um, with uh, diet and lifestyle modifications. And so if there's a dietitian out there that's telling that you have to have meat in order to uh, thrive or survive, um, then I would find a new dietitian or nutritionist, basically. Yeah, thank you. That's, that's really helpful. I think, you know, there's probably, there's a matchmaking element to it and, and finding the right fit and, and really, you know, looking introspectively at your own body and seeing what, what makes sense. Yeah, um, actually, uh, just to jump in, there's a resource, I think it's called I think it's plantbaseddoctors.com, but that's got a bunch of dietitians and doctors and you can put in your zip code and help find it. There's probably some other um, resources. Um, we're actually putting together a course um, on, uh, you know, that basically people will be certified in sort of plant-based sports nutrition. So they'll be like game changer certified essentially. And uh, so that in terms of athletics and uh, plant-based diets, you know, those are the people you're going to want to go to once that, uh, when that's available. Awesome. Thank you. Yeah, that great to, to see those resources. Uh, the next question I might put together, uh, Lori's and Nicole's question a little bit for you, Gary. Um, even if you are a nerd trapped in an athlete's body, uh, you still have to be in the locker room and deal with a lot of the, the discussions about being plant-based. You said sometimes people made comments. What's it like um, being an advocate for this, you know, kind of alternative lifestyle, um, as well as I know you're, you know, passionate about climate and, and speaking out on the environmental side of it, uh, what's it like to kind of talk about that with, with teammates as well? Most of my teammates, you know, they realize that I am, you know, a nerd trapped in athletes, but I'm always the guy talking about, you know, random things or asking them random questions that aren't related to football. Um, so it wasn't, you know, so far fetched that this was something that I kind of go down the line of. And I enjoy, you know, educating uh, people on it, you know, why I got to where I'm at and kind of, you know, showing them like, here, look, you know, you've got inflammation here and here. And it's probably because, you know, what you're eating, like try this, this and this. And, um, you know, most guys take it, you know, they're like, yeah, you know, that actually does make sense. And, um, you know, just providing the information for them and, and letting them kind of experiment on themselves. Most athletes, the main thing is just kind of keeping their weight up, you know, so they'll they'll do it after the season as like a reset, you know, like Phoebe said, but um. Like I said, I enjoy just providing the information for, for, for them and no one ever is like, dude, like, you know, what do you, why are you doing that or anything? And if they do, I just explain it. And then they're, they're fine after that. That's great. Um, Phoebe or James, do you have anything to add in, in terms of, you know, how you find yourself being an advocate for this, just as opposed to doing it for yourself and, and in your, in your own life? Sure. Yeah, I would say I definitely became comfortable debating the topic from a young age because I think especially when you when you get into a conversation around something and mention a moral standpoint or um, yeah, moral reasoning, then it's easy for other folks to immediately feel attacked. And the second that you bring in morality to a conversation, they, you know, the the unsaid underlying message there is, I think what you're doing is wrong, right? Even if that's not what you're saying. So it can be incredibly difficult. And I, um, it just takes a little bit of willingness to listen and, you know, hear their standpoint on why they disagree or why they choose to do what they do. And then, um, again, just pure persistence around, you know, I, 1000% believe in the way that I eat and the way that I live my life. So it would, I never felt ashamed in that kind of conversation. And I think when you really know that it's, it's easy to have a back and forth with someone um, keeping in mind that the quickest way to turn people off to your perspective is by being aggressive or being accusatory or, um, 
you know, any extreme that might make them feel guilty or uncomfortable. So keeping it really open and, you know, fact-based or experienced-based was always really helpful for me. Awesome. Thanks. Uh, James, anything else to add to that? I might just move on to two last questions. I, I was listening to Phoebe so intently, I forgot the question. <laughs> I think we just move on. Okay, a- <laughs> sure, no worries. Um, yeah, so Jim, I wanted to make sure that that you are part of this conversation as well. Um, I, I know that you are in the media industry and you, you talk a lot about this in ways that you know hopefully are engaging a wider audience. Um, so Tony uh, asked about uh, movements or social media movements like uh, Meatless Mondays and, and some of these. What do you see from those trends? Have you seen that kind of gaining readership or um, what have you seen there from the media perspective? Yeah, I think it's really encouraging. We're slowly seeing, as I referred to in my intro, what we're seeing is discussions about food and agriculture are becoming integrated with the broader climate debate. And it is crazy that we waited so long for this to happen, but it is happening and that's the key thing. And so as we're also just seeing more and more momentum around climate, which is fantastic. Um, so we're seeing, you know, I'm seeing a lot of discussions about food waste, for example, which is something that you only need to go back five years ago, got almost no attention. It, attention is actually an enormous source of emissions is the food we waste. So that's becoming more and more talked about. Um, and like you said, things like the Meatless Mondays are just wonderful because they avoid a lot of the kind of finger pointing um, and shaming, which, you know, unfortunately has been part of the way that we've tried to change uh, the way people think about climate. We've tried to tell people that they were doing the wrong thing. They shouldn't be driving that car. They shouldn't be getting on that plane. They need to do something different. Um, they do need to be doing these things differently. But like, when did you last change anyone's opinion by like getting in their face and pointing fingers at them and telling them they're bad people? It just doesn't work like that. The way to change, the way to shift opinions, and we know this, this is a ton of psychological and, and, and a sort of a public opinion research to back this up. The way to change people's behavior is to give them a path towards the new behavior, which is actually attractive to them. Instead of like a bad thing, it's, it's a nice path. So like Meatless Mondays and encouraging people to see that there is like incredible vegan and vegetarian meals out there there and i think critically using the plant-based label as well so i I forget i think maybe it was phoebe or or james talked about like vegetarian is like a marriage uh, you know and and that's not something that we should people really want to leap into um but plant-based is more like a kind of cool exciting thing that you can try um so all of these trends are coming together they're super encouraging there's not enough of them you know because we waited so long to integrate food and other things, and we waited so long to take serious action on climate, we are way behind schedule. So what we need is to find ways to accelerate these trends dramatically. Yeah, thank you. That's really kind of a great way to wrap it up. Um, Aaron asked one last question, but maybe I'll just ask each of the panelists to write their answer in the chat, which is, what's your best trick when you find yourself in a place where meat is really the only option. <laughs> uh, what's your favorite snack you bring with you or, or what do you do? Um, so if you wouldn't mind um, answering that in the chat, if you have kind of a favorite snack or go-to thing um, that, that you bring with you. Um, otherwise we might just wrap it up. Any last questions, uh, throw it in the chat there. Um, but uh, just thank you guys for, for a really great discussion. Um, I did want to, um, just if we can move to the next slide, um, remind everybody um, that if you're interested in learning more, um, Game Changers is available on Netflix. If you have a Netflix account or access to one, um, highly recommend for, uh, like Jim mentioned, just kind of going along this, this movement here um, and, and just dipping your toe in and learning more. I know my husband and I both, I don't think have had a single glass of milk or um, really anything after seeing this movie um, related to dairy. So, um, you know, thank you so much, James, for that. Did you want to add anything about, about the movie quickly? Uh, yeah, it's, it's not only on Netflix, it's also on iTunes, Google Play, Vimeo, and or any of those platforms. You can actually access all of those platforms um, through the website, gamechangersmovie.com. We've also put a bunch of resources on there. So people are always asking me, well, what, what recipes are there? Of course, there's loads of great recipes online, um, but we put some on um, on our website and also tips on how to change. Like uh, we sort of the 
message of this panel has also been, it's like all or something, not all or nothing. That's what we say. So any shift towards more plant-based eating, especially whole plant foods, is going to have a benefit not only for the uh, for your health, but also the, the environment as well. So um, yeah, uh, that's, that's all I've got to say. And I appreciate Great. everyone else uh, being on the panel. Yeah, no. So actually that kicks us off to the next um, piece and we can get Brittany's computer charged <laughs> um, is, is just um, a reminder uh, that this has been part of the Eco Athletes Fall Fundraiser. Um, thank you for any amount of support that, that you're able to help um, support us to you know, put on great events like this, um, get the word out about how to, how to take climate action and uh, spur, support the climate comeback as we like to say. Um, one last slide I wanted to share is a great way to dip your toe in, um, which is a, a plant-based recipe book that we're putting together from all of our Eco Athletes champions, including Gary, um, where we will, as a, as a thank you for uh, participating, um, we'll be sending out this book. So keep your eye out for that and the recording of this session. Um, there's some really great recipes in there. Um, like we said, whether you are, have been plant-based forever um, or a vegan, uh, or you just are trying it out for the first time, um, some really good recommendations for some nice comfort food. We have Thanksgiving and, and the holidays coming up. So uh, please uh, look out for that. And um, thank you all for attending. Thank you to the panelists. Thank you to Jim um, for, for moderating and um, have a great night, everyone. Thanks. Thank you. Thanks. Thanks, everyone.